today is the 15-year anniversary of Alan and Susie and family being here with us and guiding us and leading us and at St. Nicholas. So it's an opportunity to embarrass Alan. So, <laughs> so there will be slides. We've got slides. Let me see, you're right. Now, about 15 years ago, the in interview panel for the young Reverend Jenkins and his wife Susie, their daughters Caris, Abby, and Poppy, included Sue Lawrence, who was our lay reader, Angela Stevens, Margaret Shepherd, and the Archdeacon. Neither of them knew that the family made a sneak preview to the church. They came to a service without telling anybody. And Sue Lawrence remember spotting them and at the end running to the door enthusiastically in order to invite them back to the church. And you can imagine her disappointment when they said, oh, we're just visiting. Little did she know that they would be back later for the interview. Now, Susie recalls that on that secret trip, they also had a quick look at the rectory in Fife Way, and she was delighted to find it was a bungalow. Susie had some difficulty with mobility at the time, and their last house had four sets of stairs. Yes, far too many stairs, so that was an extra delight that our rectory is a bungalow. Now, Sue Lawrence was keen that Alan should be able to relate to children, and I think this slide seeing some of the slides because he can't see them. Oh, right, okay. Oh, okay. Could you turn that, Catherine? Could you just turn it to me? Yes. There. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so he had, he had no trouble relating to children. The youth group were asked to submit interview questions, and one of them was that, would you grow a beard like Jesus? I don't think he's ever done that. <laughs> don't tell the youth group. <laughs> And here's Alan at his first PCC meeting. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Tops alive. Must be some mistake. <laughs> and our next slide. The chef. This is Alan's party piece at the Holiday Club. And he embraced this role with such dramatic enthusiasm that the chef had to be written into every Holiday Club script for several years afterwards due to popular demand. And this is um, a memory from uh, Val Wilson. Alan was keen to bless us all with his ministry, including anointing Val Wilson's 1932 Austin 7 Primrose with holy water. Yes, that is a pastry brush that he is using. And yes, his lovely assistant, Karis, is holding the holy glass fruit bowl. If your car is playing up, Alan might be persuaded to carry out an exorcism of anything going wrong. Um, Alan and Susie were involved in Adventure Plus, which is an outdoor center supporting, people with, uh, supporting young people, where Karis also uh, worked. And in 2019, together with Sue Lawrence, Joy Lord, Margaret Hibbert, any others? Um, and Bill Hibbert, sorry. Uh, raised money by canoeing along the Thames from Whitney to Westminster. That is a long way. And as a result of the relationship with Adventure Plus, the, um, the climbing wall came to Bookham Village Day and has been extremely popular and successful raising money for Bookham. Now, the young Reverend Jenkins was becoming well-known and he was invited by Baroness Cox to visit churches in Nigeria. And later, the Bible Society invited him to churches in China. Alan has shown himself to be a top training incumbent for the diocese and has trained four curates to date, not forgetting John Heiner, who also trained with us for, for a year. So they're Chris, Barbara, David, and myself. That, that represents a lot of work. It's 
And finally, however, oh, we, are we, do we have, no, yes, recognition and awards. So Alan was made a canon just recently. He's also been area deacon, uh, was area deacon, is area deacon, and uh, chairs the United Bookham Charities, and many other things that won't fit on one slide. However high he may climb, he will always be Alan to us. People recall he's always been willing to put out the chairs, to do the washing up, and as you can see, always willing to be uh, fed a custard pie. I'm sure that you have many more memories of Alan's adventures at St. Nicholas, so do share them after the service when there will be coffee and uh, cake and possibly even some fizz. But before we finish, um, uh, Catherine, our uh, warden, has something to give Susie and Alan. Susie, would you like to come up to the front? Alan, would you like to come and stand here? Mm. Well, look, you're very kind, and thank you very much for this. Um, it is indeed 15 years since we came here. Is it actually today? Is today the... It was the 20, or it was the 22nd, Susie says. So anyway, it's 15 years ago. But let me just quickly, I've, I don't know if I've ever told this story, and um, Jill did allude to it, but it is an interesting one. Um, and it's not the reason we're here, but it is worth kind of knowing this. Uh, on the Saturday, before we came to take an informal look at this church on the Sunday, we knew nothing about this church. We had no details. Um, Susie said to me, I think we need our next vicarage to be a bungalow. And that was because she'd hurt herself and was struggling with our four staircases. And I said to her, well, that's a nice idea, but I've never, ever seen a vicarage that's a bungalow. I don't think they exist. <laughs> and the very next day, as Jill rightly said, we came to Bookham, and we did take a quick look at the uh, rectory after the service, and we were astounded to see it was a bungalow. So I'm not saying um, that's why we came here. <laughs> It wasn't for that reason. But it is interesting, isn't it, that God in his economy, you know, gives us these opportunities just to have a conversation. And maybe they, they seem significant in retrospect. And you can make about what you like, that story. But um, it was an extraordinary weekend, really, where we had the conversation Saturday and the bungalow appeared on a Sunday. But um, I, I won't go on at length because I know time is an issue. But um, I could say a lot more. But thank you very much. Your generosity and... Uh, you're, you're very kind, and we do appreciate it. And, well, we love you all. <laughs> the Old Testament reading is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, beginning. The Mountain of the Lord, page 687 in the Church Bibles. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many, many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew.
But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Father, may these spoken words be faithful to the written word and lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I wonder what your view of this world is. Big question. You see it carrying on pretty much as it is now, forever and ever, or do you see it as cyclical, maybe returning to some earlier point, maybe back to the beginning and starting all over again? Or do you see it as linear, with a beginning and an end? Well, a biblical worldview sees this world very much as linear, with a beginning and an end point. As to what that end point will be like, well, uh, I respectfully disagree with uh, the group Beautiful South in their album, Blue is the Color. Here are some words from a track called One God. The world won't end in darkness. It'll end in family fun with Coca-Cola clouds behind a Big Mac sun. (laughs) Well, it's creative, let's grant them, but it's not biblical. A biblical view of the world sees very much the end coming with the return of Jesus Christ. And of course, that's a belief we affirm every time we say the Nicene Creed together, which We will do so today. He, that is Jesus, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. That is a dramatic statement by any stretch of the imagination. And not only that, when Jesus does return, this time it will be not to suffer, but to reign. Hallelujah. This, though, not unnaturally, begs a question. When will this be? When is this going to happen? When will Jesus return? Well, not surprisingly, Jesus' own disciples had exactly that question. Matthew 24, verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. Jesus' reply to their question, in a nutshell, was it will be unexpected. But not unexpected in the sense they don't know it's going to happen, because they do. But rather unexpected insofar as they don't know when it will be. Here are three ways in which our Gospel reading today underlined the fact that Jesus' return will be unexpected. First of all, by means of some plain teaching, here again is verse 36. But about that day or hour, 
No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Well, at first glance, that statement may appear to us a little bit shocking. While we might accept that the angels don't know when Christ will return, for Jesus himself to say he doesn't know when he will return, we might think, come on, Jesus, you ought to know. But actually, this is something about the humanity of Christ. When he became human, he shared his life among us, He limited certain aspects of his being, not least his knowledge of certain things, which is why when he was asked questions, uh, why he asked questions, because he needed to know what he didn't know. So first of all, Jesus underlines the unexpectedness of his return by means of some plain teaching. Second, he underlines the unexpectedness of his return by means of an Old Testament parallel. Here again is verse 37 of our reading. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Well, I'm sure many of you, most of you know the story, Genesis chapter 6 through to chapter 9, if you want to read it for yourself. But here we have a pretty good summary of it. In a nutshell, when the flood came, all but Noah and his immediate family drowned. It caught them unawares. They were not expecting it. In fact, they laugh at Noah building his ark. You know what strikes me about the examples that Jesus gives here of what the people were doing when the flood came. What they were doing was so ordinary. So every day they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. It doesn't say they were robbing banks or cheating on their tax returns or indeed indulging in road rage or whatever the antediluvian equivalent would have been. They were doing ordinary things, and they were unprepared. And similarly, says Jesus, it will be the case when he returns. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Ordinary people doing ordinary things, but unprepared for Jesus' return. So secondly, Jesus underlines the unexpectedness of his return by means of this Old Testament parallel. And then third, he underlines the unexpected, unexpectedness of his return by means of an everyday example. Here again is verse 43, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Well, it is obvious, isn't it? If you know a burglar is coming, you don't open the doors and windows, put a sign out saying burglars this way, and then disappear for a couple of days. No, you do everything within your power to protect your home. But the point, of course, is, as a rule, you don't know when a burglar is coming. No, his or her coming is unexpected, just like the return of Jesus will be. Three ways, then, in which Jesus underlines the unexpectedness of his return. By means of some plain teaching, by means of an Old Testament parallel, and by means of an everyday example. Now, if it is the case that Jesus will return again one day, but we don't know when it's going to be. What are we to do? Let me offer you two suggestions. The first is that we shouldn't waste time trying to work out when it will be because we simply don't know. Indeed, it's not simply that we'll waste time trying to work out when it will be, but actually we will be being disobedient to what we are told. Here is Acts 1 verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. 
So unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses or countless other organizations or individuals who have sought to predict the day of Jesus' return, including indeed one Harold Camping who predicted the return of Jesus on the 21st of May 2011, very specific for sure, we rest content in not knowing because we know that we cannot know. So first of all, we shouldn't waste time trying to work out when Jesus' return will be. And then the second thing we are to do as we await the return of Jesus is to keep watch. That is quite clear from verse 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Keep watch. What does that mean? Well, because we are citizens of two countries, in other words, those who live in the present, in this world, but we also live partially in the age to come, the life of heaven, we need to strike a balance. On the one hand, we need to get on with our lives. It means getting on with creating and planning, working, resting, going to the movies, celebrating, and everything else that is so familiar to us. And it definitely doesn't mean, as some have done in the past, selling all our possessions, uh, rushing to the mountains, and sitting, waiting, doing nothing. Not at all. On the other hand, it means living our lives with a certain awareness and expectation that Jesus could return at any time. In other words, not being so overly preoccupied with our everyday activities that we spare not a moment's thought on the fact that Jesus will return one day. I quite like how writer Michael Green puts it. Christians are to watch, not like astronomers through a telescope or guards on a closed circuit television screen, but like lovers who can't wait for another glimpse of the beloved or captives in a labor camp longing for the day which will allow them home. I also quite like the way in which commentator John Proctor puts it when referring to the little parable about the thief, which we thought about already. This parable is about living the sort of spiritual life that is vigilant, involved, alive to the work of God in our world. It speaks against a dozy, careless, and casual faith. Not dozy, not careless, not casual. Do any of those words apply to you? Probably not, but it's maybe worth checking ourselves before we head too far into the coming week. Well, I'd like to end with a very short story. The Scots preacher, Robert Murray McShane, was going to be preaching on the coming of Christ and the judgment to follow. Before the service, he asked the elders one by one, do you think that Christ will come again tonight? And one by one, they all replied, no, I don't think so. Then McShane announced his text, the Son of Man cometh at an hour that ye think not. So in our Living Faith section today going to focus just briefly on St. Nicholas House Groups. I was at a conference recently about church growth with an evangelist called J. John, and he said one of the key aspects you'll find of any church that is growing is good house groups. So it seemed a good place to, to start. Did you know that we've got 60 members of congregations regularly attending house groups? We've got eight of them and they meet monthly, bi-weekly, and some even weekly. So we've already got a great start. But maybe some of you have thought about joining and don't know quite what's involved. So I've got a few stooges, I mean people, to come forward and tell you about the experience that Tristan is going to come forward, and Mary. So, May, will you tell us which house group you're in, how many people are in it, and how, when, uh, who leads it, and um, how long you've been attending. So, statistics. 
statistics. <laughs> I'm in group 89, and there are 12 people in the group. We meet twice a month. Romy Krizik is our convener, and I've been here in the group for 25 years. I joined it as soon as I joined St. Nicholas Church. You can see why we chose Mary. <laughs> what sort of thing do you do when you get together in your house group? Oh, well, we have uh, two socials a year, which are very nice, one at Christmas and one in the summer. And, of course, we study the Bible together. And it's very nice because we're all at the same sort of level and we learn from each other. And it's not too complicated. It's, it's, we hope that we can reach out and accept everybody's view and learn from each other. That's lovely. And personally, what do you get out of it? How does it benefit you? Well, I think definitely friendship. And also, I think that um, people who belong to a house group, they do actually get involved in the life of the church. I was thrilled to notice how that happened in our house group. And uh, so it has a spin-off for the church as well. Lovely. And would you recommend that people join if they're thinking oh, yes, about it? Yes, yes. I've been doing it for 25 years. That's lovely. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Right, we're going to ask Tristan if the mic stretches. It does. Hi. Same questions. Do you need me to repeat? No, one? no, no. Um, so, so I'm in 4W. <laughs> I think there's some sort of gang sign. Um, and, and I think there, there were 11 of us. Um, I think, forgive me if I've got the numbers wrong. Um, I've been going for about two years, and um, it's convened by Joy Lord, um, but actually we, we tend to take it in turns to lead, and uh, we meet usually every two weeks, uh, but if we're following a sermon series, then we'll, we'll meet every week. Um, and we do uh, a mixture of some uh, themed Bible books sometimes, so we're looking at at women uh, in the Bible at the moment. And um, as I said, we just finished following the, the last sermon series uh, as well. And we tend to take it in turns to, to sort of lead a session. Um, and we, we sit around and, and, and um, go deeper. And what would you say that you personally get out of attending? So I think I, I get two things out of it. I get fellowship, which is fantastic. Um, and um, without... Um, meaning to sound um, rude, um, I think uh, I enjoy being with a lot of people who have more wisdom from experience from living a bit longer than myself. Um, <laughs> the exception of Zena, who I think is younger than me. Um, but this is, this is great. It, it's going back to basics. The church family is intergenerational, and, and I really appreciate uh, that. Um, and with that fellowship comes not just through our weekly meetings, but also a WhatsApp group. Um, and we know that we lift each other up in prayer um, for every little thing that's going on in our lives um, or, or some really big things. And, and just having those people who know you a little bit um, closer, you're able to share concerns and, and things. It is really... I think going back to the basics of the church um, and um, the discipleship as well um, is, is, fan is fantastic um, because, as I say, I think it really is going back to the basics of the church. And so, would you recommend it? I think you would. I, I would, absolutely. I, I do feel, and I, I was talking with Celeste as well, that um, it's great that we have lots of people already involved, but that means there are people who aren't. And it does mean that we need to grow, I think, um, if I may, <laughs> um, sort of, as, sort of just, just say that I, when, when I was young, that my last um, time I was in a house group, um, I was a teenager, we called them cells, and the idea was that they multiplied, and then they divided, and multiplied and divided. And so, uh, although it's fantastic, and I hope to be in 4W for, for many years, I, I would hope that actually that there's some growth 
uh, division and, and more uh, multiplication that happens. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. So if you are interested in finding out more, you can do tasters and you can go along and uh, taste several and see what they're like. And Jean Forward is a lady you need to see who is hiding <laughs> at the back there. And she can give you more information. So I hope that's whetted your appetite if you're thinking about house groups. Thank you so much, Tristan and Mary. Thanks. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. O Lord our God, make us watchful and keep us faithful as we await the coming of your Son, our Lord, that when he shall appear, he may find us not sleeping, but active in his service and joyful in his praise. Loving Father, you have called us to be a caring church, reflecting in our lives your infinite care for us, your children. Help us to fulfill our calling and to care for one another in an unselfish fellowship of love and to care for the world around us in sharing with it the good news of your love and serving those who suffer from poverty, hunger, and disease. We pray for the many areas in the world where there is conflict and trauma. Thinking in particular this morning of Ischia following the landslide which has just taken place there, and of Ukraine and the ongoing war there. Lord, please give courage, perseverance and hope to all oppressed peoples, so that they are able to keep going and help them to know that whatever trials they have to bear, each one of them is your child and you love them. We pray for those who have power of life or death over others, asking that this power be used with wisdom and justice and that in the end, goodness will prevail. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for the ECHO team here and for Margaret Hibbert and Val Lambert who work so hard to further its work. We give thanks for fair trade sales, for the efforts made to recycle as much as possible. And we ask that you will guide each one of us to be aware of the effects of climate change worldwide. Please show us what we can do in any small way to minimize its effects. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of your wonderful world. Lord, we thank you for all the work that has been done to move our church forward. Today, we pray especially for Alan, as he strives to make us confident in our witness and service. We give thanks for our church family, and in particular, for those who have recently joined us. We ask that you will help us to be a loving, inclusive community, ensuring that all who come here are warmly welcomed. Lord, in your mercy, Thank you, Lord, for our village and for all that goes on here. Today, we pray especially for those who live in Eastwick Park Avenue, asking that they be good neighbors towards one another so that no one feels isolated or lonely. From our electoral roll, we pray for Robert, Pam, Pamela, Anne, Caroline, and Margaret giving thanks for their presence among us and for all that each one of them does to further the life of the church. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, please be with all who are struggling with ill health. We pray for Eldred Clark, Tim Carlier, Elizabeth Finucane, Catherine Jobson, Valerie Good, Phyllis Collins, 
Deborah Gallagher and Mike Eason. Also, we pray for anyone who has recently undergone an operation, that you will be with them in their recovery. Lord, give them strength in their adversity. Support them, we pray, and all those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we remember before you Dorothy Foster, giving thanks for her life and for all that she did. We pray for her family and friends, asking that they may be comforted in their loss and in the knowledge that they are not alone. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.